go. I've got to go to drinks. Okay. See ya. Bye. Hello, everyone. I've been getting beautiful text messages from people. Hello, Kay. Hello, Alison. Hi, Renee. Hello, Robin Deb. Little keen beans. All ready for tonight? Well, it's a lovely evening for drinking chilled Pinot Gris here at Murdoch. It's a bit cold and it's a bit cold and damp. It feels like it's going to rain any minute now. But anyway, shell sounds awesome. Dumplings, oh yum! Come by, good work. Emily and Kevin, how you doing? Hello, Sarah Tricks and all the Trixes. Great to see you all. Well. What a week it's been! I don't know about you guys. I got. I. I don't feel like last week was very. Um, was very together with our technical issues, and I'm hoping that we're not going to have technical issues tonight. But uh, we got there. Hello, Angela. How are you going? Leftover roast. Oh, yum! Delish. <sighs> Where are you going, Angela? Everyone's going on holidays. Isn't it exciting? We're being let out. Happy birthday, Andrew! Yay! <gasps> Um, yes, we're being let out for a few moments. I don't know what's going to happen in the next few days. And uh, I hear for those of you in um, Sydney, uh, we feel your pain. <laughs> uh, I was actually supposed to be coming to you from Queensland today, but from Brisbane, but um, that trip got cancelled. Uh, I actually could be there now. I think the border opened last night or this morning or something. Anyway, doesn't matter. Oh, hi, Zoe. How are you going? Um, Michael, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I, tr I try my best. I'm not a techno geek, but I do try my best. And hopefully this week, uh, technology will be on my side. Um, now, I also, I couldn't remember for the life of me which wine I said we were going to do tonight um, at, at the end of the sign-off last week. So I hope I haven't confused people by nominating a different wine on Tuesday than what I originally said. Uh, too many dumplings, good Zach and Jack and Hannah. Too many dumplings is always the right number of dumplings. Um, you always have to have just one too many or maybe three. Uh, yeah, so um, I decided on Tuesday when I looked at what we had left and I thought balance. We've had three red wines, so it makes sense to have a white wine today. I did say Chardonnay. I know I'm sorry, Michael. I've already, I have actually been told off by, um, by somebody else about that, but that's okay. We'll be okay. Um, I hope that it didn't throw you too much. Uh, and I hope you read the email on Tuesday. It went out sort of, um, sort of latish on Tuesday. But I decided, I just thought, you know, we'll keep the Chardonnay for our last uh, session of this pack because it's got a bit of age on it. It's a bit special and we've been tasting new releases. So I thought um, we might do the Pinot Gris today. So Pinot Gris. 2017 uh, and I thought it was a nice opportunity for people to get their charcuterie platters on or their dumplings on which it sounds like a lot of you have done which is great hello Daryl and Sue how are you going hi Craig oh yum beautiful well it sounds like the catering court at um at your place Craig has done a great job well done Joan thank you I did say, thank you, Kay. <laughs> I think I said, I think I said all the wines that we had left and then sort of randomly picked one and then lost my mind again. So anyway, Pinot Gris, we got, we're on Pinot Gris. Um, I think it will be delicious. Shall we open it up and find out? Hopefully you guys have already got some in your glass. I decided to go for a, well, this is this is um, a Riedel glass and it's called a Sangiovese glass or a Riesling glass, but it's also, to my mind, the perfect all-rounder glass because it looks pretty much like an ISO tasting glass, that classic tulip shape. It's just a little bit bigger. Michael, Sangiovese, wow, delicious. Lots of ginger. Yes, so this wine can handle ginger. It can handle a bit of spice. Really good, particularly as we're going for the 2017, which is our new release. Um, we haven't quite released it at Cellar Door yet. Um, we've got a little bit of the 2016 left. So if you are a fan of the 16, now is the time to um, stock up on a on, on a few bottles or a case or three uh, before it sells out because I think the 16 is looking delicious at the moment. And as we've discovered during this tasting uh, journey that we've gone on, 
I have to stop saying journey. I've said journey like three times this week and I hate it. It's like it's like pivot and all those other words, all those other jargonistic words that everyone's kind of started using um, in the last uh, in the last little while. But anyway, on this little on this little um, adventure that we've gone on together, we've tasted a few older Pinot Gris and we know that the Muradaka State Pinot Gris age well. So if you like the 16 and you've been a fan of the 16, um, we are coming towards the end of it and you should grab some before it's gone. We are tasting the 17 tonight, as you know. You know hello, Nina, how are you? Was that you sending me a photograph? There's a couple of photographs from people who my phone doesn't seem to know people's phone numbers. I did something, my phone did something weird a, a few days ago and I had to reset it and stuff and it's lost a little bit of information. So <laughs> that'll be fun for me for the next few weeks. Anyway, it wasn't you, Nina. Okay. Well, it was someone who's got a rug quite like yours. So that'll be interesting to find out who that is. Uh, anyway, yes, Pinot Gris. So let's, uh, let, us, let us recap on what we're trying to do with Pinot Gris here at Muradaka State because Pinot Gris, as we've discussed before, is quite a fickle grape variety and a lot of people treat it mean and it doesn't particularly... Was it UK? No, I, I got yours, Kay, but I think there was somebody else also sent me a. Anyway, I'll check later. I'll I'll set uh, whoever whoever sent me a picture with the beautiful rug with the um little people on it that's blue and red. I'm not quite sure who that is. I don't think it's Kay, but anyway, lovely to see you all. Anyway, and thank you for sending me your photos. Oh my goodness! I also have to announce the winner of the food photography and wine and food matching competition from last week. So um, I will be doing that sometime in the next 20 minutes. So <laughs> hopefully that'll keep you interested for long enough. Uh, yes, there were some really fabulous photographs that came through. It was very difficult for us to decide. I had to get a whole team of judges in to look at it. And there were a lot of very close, um, close seconds and thirds. But uh, we do have a winner. So hold tight. I'll let you know about that in a minute. Let me talk about the wine first. That'll keep you all on, your, on the edge of your seats, won't it? So... The wine, Pinot Gris. Pinot Gris, uh, as a grape variety, gets a bit used and abused in this country. Uh, you will, Emily. I will send it out. Uh, <laughs> Michael, thank you. I don't ever finish in 30 minutes, do I? That's true. Um, yes, Emily, I will send the winning photo plus the runners-up out at the beginning of next week with the next email for you guys just so you can all see how gorgeous how gorgeous all of your food is. So, um, yes, absolutely. Uh this has been a crazy week for us. I don't quite know what's happened, but it's all kind of gone a bit fast and a bit mental, and I, I'm not really sure why or what extra has been achieved as a result, but it just feels like I've been running all week to try and catch up to things. So it's really nice to sit down, take a breath, and have a glass of wine with you guys. So, wine. <laughs> Pinot Gris. Pinot Gris, used and abused. Lots of people in Australia treat it like the new Sauvignon Blanc. So they grow it in places where it's easy to grow. They put lots of water on it. They grow it in big, you know, um, high-yielding high um, uh, on the vine, so growing lots of bunches on the vine, so not a lot of concentration of flavour. Often they'll pick it early to keep it crisp because Pinot Gris is a grape variety when it's fully ripe and develops all of its flavour compounds, actually is a wine that has medium acidity. So... I think that as Australians, we're getting better at dealing with wines with a bit less acidity. You know, Viognier is another great variety that we, we don't grow here. But a lot of Australians, when they started growing Viognier, were worried to let it get too ripe because the acid dropped out and then it was a weird shape. But if you taste a really good Viognier from Condrieu or somewhere in the Northern Rhone, these wines are ripe and they smell of apricots and honey and they have quite soft acidity, but they've got a lot of um, textural quality that sits in place of the acid and gives the wine a different kind of structure. And I think Pinot Gris, when it's fully ripe, is very similar. It, it has this medium acid weight, so it's not crisp and crunchy like a, like a Chardonnay or a Riesling. And it has that lovely oily textural quality that Craig mentioned um, just before. So uh, there's an oily texture to it. There's a richness to it. And there's a, there's a ripe fruitedness to it um, that is something that we always look for in our Pinot Gris. 
Pinot Gris as a grape variety is classically described as smelling of pears. And I think that um, our Pinot Gris, it's really interesting because we get it ripe and we get all this flavour in it and then we make it into wine. And because of the way we do the winemaking, um, we lose a bit of the fruit in the wine as a young wine and it comes back slowly as the wine ages. So I think, I think um, oh, Craig, that's a, that's a WSET question if ever I heard one. I haven't put it in my mouth yet, so um, just give me a moment and I'll answer your full body, medium body question in just a moment. Um, uh, so um, what we do to the wine to make it is basically the same thing as we do to Chardonnay, except we don't put it in any new oak. So we handpick the grapes. We get the grapes nice and ripe. We get that lovely pear fruit ripeness. We get good good sugar levels, um, medium acidity, and that's why it works really well with chili, ginger, and wasabi. Those spicy characters, the lower acid in the in the wine as a as a white wine, it works really well with those spicy characters, which is why it works really well with a lot of those Asian um, Asian food flavors. Uh, it doesn't <laughs> good work, Rob. <laughs> Um, it doesn't have any residual sugar and a lot of people when they get their Pinot Gris nice and ripe then worry that there's going to be too much alcohol or that it's going to be too um, too dry and so then they leave some residual sugar and we don't like residual sugar in our Pinot Gris so this wine is completely dry. The alcohol is around 14% alcohol which is higher than our Chardonnays because we've got it riper. So you're getting this kind of ripeness um, matrix without the wine being too big and too textural and too oily and too fat because of where we grow it being on the Mornington Peninsula having that beautiful cool maritime climate it manages to hold enough of the acidity and those savory characters in the skin um, to give the wine a textural quality and give it a, a give it a structure that means that it's quite um, as a young wine it's quite tight and it's quite firm this is a 2017 and we're just releasing it now. A lot of people will be selling their 2019 or even their 2020 Pinot Gris and I know of at least somebody who's just bottled their 2021 Pinot Gris to get it out on the market as fast as possible. Those sort of wines are made usually very quickly, fermented very quickly and um, cleaned up and got ready for bottle and they're all about sort of very forward primary fruit characters. We find when this wine goes to bottle, after <laughs> yeah absolutely Robin Craig open your wine store in retirement I think that would be lovely um when uh when we put this wine in bottle it kind of closes down and you get all the minerally characters coming through and all the fruit disappears for a while which is why we hold it back for a little while 2017 we're on 2021 now so that wine is four years old um but that it needs that bit of bottle age for that pear fruit and that little bit of honey and spice to start coming forward. Before that, it's all kind of folded in on itself and the wine is quite, it looks almost neutral because it's just not expressing anything. There's lots of texture but not a lot of um, aroma or flavour profile. So let us get on with the technical tasting for our WSET students amongst us. <laughs> Hopefully this won't get too boring for people. There is a lot of 2021 stuff from uh, from from um, Hunter and Canberra, absolutely, um, and 2020 smoke taint, absolutely, Craig. So a lot of people have had to kind of push things forward and get things out as quickly as possible. So they've actually got some white wine to sell, um, which is a shame, I think. But you know that's okay. You just do different, use different wine making techniques. Um, different regions have different ways of dealing with things and we like to let this wine have eight months in barrel. It's old oak, it's wild fermented, it, we let it go through a malolactic fermentation. So it has lots of, it has, it does go through lots of phases of its winemaking so it needs longer in the bottle to kind of just sort of shrug into, shrug all those things into shape and into place so that the wine is, is, uh, is in balance with itself and ready to be drunk. So on the nose it, there's a little bit of pear fruit there it's for me it's kind of a yellow a ripe yellow pear rather than a crunchy green pear and this wine um previously when it was younger looked a bit more crunchy green so it's softening out a little bit there's this beautiful honey character um that's just starting to come up and some nice spice characters i'm going to have a little sip before i answer any more questions
Mm. So Craig asked if this was a medium-bodied or a full-bodied wine. I would probably call this wine a medium-bodied wine, but it has a lot of flavour to it. It's got a lot of intensity and um, and it's got lots of layers of flavour, so it's quite elegant. So, Emily, this wine ages very, very well. The 2013 uh, we tasted together last year. Um, I'm not sure whether you were on the on the tasting group then, but we might revisit it uh, in one of the packs later on this year. We had the 2013, we had the 2012, and they were quite, they both had aged really, really well, quite differently. What you'll see is that that sort of time in really, it's got this kind of slaty kind of taste to the finish of it. Um, and that will soften and the fruit will come forward and you get this lovely sort of like almost poached pear, poached quince kind of um, fruit characters coming through, more honey, more spice. And it's kind of, it becomes a sort of, it becomes a more full bodied wine with age. It's sort of, it's like a, it, it's like a, a rose opening all its petals and becoming fully, um, fully blown um, over time and I think the 13 is looking fabulous at the moment uh Emily and Kay and it's not going to fall over anytime soon I don't think I think that one's looking great uh yes we would definitely come back in 10 15 years Michael to um <laughs> to retaste this wine I will put enough aside in the museum so that we can do that I wonder if we will be doing drinks with Kate still but in in uh in 10 years time it'll be interesting to see we may be uh we may have graduated to trips to italy with kate perhaps <laughs> drinks with kate in italy and other places she likes um that would be quite fun but i think uh we'll cheers with kate ha <laughs> ha um well actually i do have to um in a, when, once we finish talking about this wine i'm going to duck over to the other table for a second and leave you to talk amongst yourselves because I do have something very exciting to show you as well as announcing the winner of the um, of the food and wine matching competition last week I have a prototype design of the drinks with Kate hoodie da -da -da -da, that Pete's come up with and I need your feedback so don't let me go without showing you that either lots of things for you to remind me of tonight because i um, yes, uh, I think I was a bit scatty last week, so I'm, I'm intent on making sure that we get through everything tonight. Hey, by the way, look, my fingernails nearly grown out. <laughs> Just thought you'd like to get a little, get a little uh, update on the fingernail. Um, <laughs> I think we do need to have a Pinot Gris tasting party, Emily. And in fact, uh, our wine, one of our wine club lunches that is coming up. Um, in, I want to say August, but it might be July and we'll be, hello, Jeff and Sue, how are you going? Um, glad you made it. Uh, one of, um, one of my, thank you, Renee. Oh, hello, Nigel. Thank you. Uh, Nigel's very good at wearing hoodies. We gave him a hoodie from, um, vintage and I don't think he's taken it off. <laughs> Uh, it, yeah, no, the hoodies are really good. I, I can highly recommend the hoodies. So um, what was I saying? Oh, Pinot Gris lunch. Uh, we've got a Pinot Gris lunch coming up and I'll check the dates and I'll let you guys know next week and I'll put it, well, Jeff and I will put it up on the, um, I haven't seen Jeff yet. Jeff, are you there? Jeff Plan? Any Jeff, any, any Jeff Plans tonight? Any Jeremy's? Hello, Jeremy. I think Jeremy's drinking and drinking wine and cooking dinner again tonight, so uh, he's probably not got time to 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 um, to uh, have a chat to us tonight. But that's okay. Um, Pinot Gris lunch. So we're going to do a Pinot Gris lunch uh, coming up in um, July or August. I have to check the dates, uh, and we're going to do some Murdoch State Pinot Gris current release and some back vintages, and we're going to throw in a couple of Pinot Gris from other places in the world just for fun. So a, little, a couple of Italians and maybe an Alsace or two just to kind of really get that whole Pinot Gris thing happening um, and really get our heads around why Pinot Gris is such an awesome grape variety and why we need to, in Australia, generally in our Pinot Gris production, lift our game. Um, excellent. Oh, no, Michael, sorry. You have to, you have to, when you order things that are secret, you have to tell us, um, tell us that they have to be secret. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how we're going to, no, it's good. Sure, I'm sure your wife will enjoy the duck pinot um, very much when you share it with her. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so opening up in the glass. And why did I put it in this glass and not a Pinot Noir glass? Now, I, it really, it's just a whim of mine, but I find with the younger wine, um, these narrower glasses just tend to hold the hold the wine together um, and hold its freshness a little bit more, whereas the Pinot Noir glass will give you, will probably let the wine open up faster and it'll evolve more quickly in the glass. But you sort of lose a bit of that kind of focus, which is which is quite nice. Oh, good, Craig, that sounds great. No, I don't think we want anyone from Sydney here at the moment. You guys are all um, you guys are all in, infested with COVID, aren't you? I think we've just got rid of it and uh, sent it up to sent it up to, to Sydney. Sorry, no, I think we by then it'll be fine. It'll be fine, Craig. It'll all be sorted out by July or August <laughs> in Moama. Good on you. Yeah, Craig. Okay, I saw that. That sounds lovely. Um, well, I think that um, we've got uh, we've got people from here who are supposed to be taking holidays in the next couple of weeks, and I think that most of us have decided that we'll have Victorian holidays if we're in Victoria already, um, just just so we don't get caught on the wrong side of the border and have to quarantine. It's all a bit it's all a bit boring, really, isn't it? I'm really looking. I was really looking forward to coming. Like I've been dreaming of coming up to Sydney and going to Mr Wong's and walking the streets of Sydney again, and maybe having a little cocktail at Cafe Sydney and all those places and Adelaide next month I'm supposed to be going to so anyway we'll stop talking about things we're supposed to be doing in places that we can't be and we'll talk about being here and now and drinking our wine so how is yes I could go to the Yarra that would be awesome Craig I also can go up the coast I can go to Anglesey I can go and see my friends in Indented Head I can go up the coast all the way to I can actually go to Adelaide now I think off to Darwin tomorrow. Oh, great, Michael. That'll be fabulous. Um, I'm not sure how much great Pinot is going to be in Darwin, but it will be beautiful. And I've got friends who are also going to um, who are going to the Northern Territory for their school holidays, and they're very excited that they can actually go. So Rob would like some um, points as to the difference in the aroma and flavour profile. The differences between the aromas and the flavours in this wine or compared to other wines? Let's go through it anyway. So uh, for me, oh, Craig, that's lovely. Thank you. <laughs> Karen's corner and back. Very good. Very good, Jack, Jack and Zach. That sounds great. In this wine, I get, so I'm getting some pear fruit on the nose. I'm not seeing very much quince at all yet, but it is just starting to peek through as the air works on it. There's a really lovely little savoury aniseedy fennel kind of a note here as well, which I always see in this wine when it's young. Uh, Richard's just arrived and is looking thirsty. He's got an empty glass and it's a Pinot Noir glass. He's decided to put his uh, Pinot Gris into. There you go, Dad. Yeah. Enjoy. Do you need one for Jill, or is she? Yeah, she's she's, um, she's resting, drinking her tea. Jill's being um, grown up. Uh, I think that the honey is starting to show through as well on the nose. So on the nose, it smells quite rich. It's got those little savoury sort of fennel and aniseed sort of notes, but there's that rich that that sort of yellow pear, tiny bit of quince, that lovely honey sort of almost. You know how honey can smell sweet but also um, quite minerally as well at times? It's got that sort of waxy, lanolin-y uh, kind of character to it. And I, and I really, I'm getting that coming through on the nose of this one now. It sort of almost smells like a beeswax candle burning in the background, which is rather lovely. Um, and then on the palate, there's a lot less... There's a lot less of the sort of um, the, the nose hints of sweetness, whereas on the palate it's quite dry. It's got that it, on the palate it, it comes back more to those kind of crunchy green pears and apple kind of fruit, which is really lovely and makes the mouth water. Uh, there's a, there is that little residual kind of flavour of honey without the sweetness and there's that little, there's the herbal kind of fennel aniseed kind of note there as well. But it's much more savoury on the on the palate. It's quite hard to describe the palate, I think, on its own. 
The acid is medium, as I said. The alcohol, it's up around 14 or just over 14. So you're almost in the high zone for, um, for alcohol with this wine because, as I said before, we did allow it to ferment all the way through to dryness, which means that the wine has a savouriness and, and a slight austerity on the palate as a young wine and will develop more richness and more, um, more honeyed kind of texture to it more glycerols as it as it um as it ages hello jeff lovely to see you finally uh prosciutto wrapped cheese sticks oh yum that sounds delicious Kay. um and and so so for me uh for me rob um this wine smells richer on the nose than it tastes on the palate but then on the palate it's got this wonderful textural quality it's got these lovely phenolics that make it interesting and make it sort of um, a much more complex wine than it might be without them if that makes sense it also makes it a wine that's fabulous with food and for those of you who have gone with your cheese and cheese and ham and prosciutto and and jamon and maybe some cabana or some salami or whatever it works really well because it works well with the saltiness and the sweetness and the fattiness of the meat and the cheese um and and the flavors in pinot gris work really really well with those with those characters in that kind of food but if you put it with your more asian foods your dumplings and soy sauce and chili and ginger and those kind of things then the fruit works really well with the with the ginger and the and and the chili and that medium acidity and that textural quality uh works really really well and doesn't fight with the spices but again the fatty sweetness of the meat in a dumpling so dumplings um have this lovely sort of fatty sweetness to them whether they're pork or prawn or chicken or a mix they have this lovely sweetness and spiciness to them and juiciness to them which works really really well with this kind of wine i think um sanctuary bao same thing you know you've got the you've got the saltiness from the from the soy sauce and you've got the spice from the chili and the tanginess from the ginger and that lovely sweet fattiness from the meat uh, and the crunchiness of the of the lettuce leaves all of those textures and flavors kind of come together to work really really well with this wine and talking about all this food it's actually making my mouth water it's making me really really <laughs> hungry um I agree, Craig, and I think the thing that's really lovely about um, about this wine is that it doesn't have that. It doesn't go sour because it doesn't have added. It doesn't have a lot of acid added to it to kind of try and balance it. And a lot of people in Australia, when they're making Pinot Gris, will either pick it really early so it doesn't have the richness of fruit flavour that we get here, and they retain the acidity, but the acidity is maybe a little bit underripe and has that sourness and that greenness to it, or they'll add a lot of acid to a to a very ripe pinot gris to try and make it more tangy and that feels out of balance as well if you've got a lot of if you've got a lot of acid in a wine that has this this level of ripeness so i think that that that's the lovely thing we get good natural acidity in the grapes here anyway so it's not going to be flabby and falling apart you still get that nice um acid sort of uh, textural quality on the palate, but it's not it's not really high, and it's and it's got a softness and a and a sort of a a mouth wrapping kind of ripeness to it. So the acids ripe and the fruit flavors are ripe, and there's no we don't have to add sugar to kind of hide that sourness. It just doesn't have sourness in it to start off with, which is really cool. Um, and what's really great about this cool maritime climate that we can let the grapes stay on the vine for a bit longer, and they ripen slowly, and they don't get out of control ripe and we get lovely ripe um, acid as well as ripe fruit flavors angela how do they add acid well that's a technical question for me um wine making uh, so wine so grape juice naturally has um a couple of acids occurring in it mostly tartaric acid and malic acid which is that acid that we've talked about before that if you let it go through a malolactic conversion then the malic acid which tastes like the acid that you get in green apples changes to lactic acid which is the acid that you get in milk and cream and butter and cheese uh, but the but the other the main acid is is tartaric acid and uh and when you're making wine and you pick the grapes and you check the <laughs> I'll answer that in a minute, Craig. That's a good question. Um, 
when you pick the grapes and you, you press the grapes, then we analyse the juice and we have a look at what the sugar levels are and the acid levels are and the pH. Uh, and people will add acid for a couple of different reasons. Sometimes the pH will be a little bit high and the higher the pH, the less um, the less microbiologically stable the wine will be. And what I mean by that is in winemaking, we use a little bit of sulphur dioxide to help sulphur to help um, uh, to help to stabilize the wine. And if you've got a low pH, then sulphur works much better in lower quantities, so you don't need to add as much sulphur. So everything's everything kind of works better at a lower pH. So you may, as a winemaker, choose to add a little bit of acid right at the beginning of the process, just as the juice is made before it starts fermenting. Then, um, <laughs> then, uh, then the, um, the the pH drops below three point five. And one day, when you've got a couple of hours, I'll get Richard to give his three point five pH um, lecture to you all. Uh, we'll see if we can get it in um, around the forty minute mark because that seems to be my um, time zone really isn't it Michael uh, and so you can add tartaric acid um, at the beginning of the winemaking and usually it's just a little bit to correct the pH but some people will add acid because they don't feel that the wine tastes acidic enough and sometimes they'll add it at the beginning but often they'll add it at the end and then you have to add a lot more acid because of the chemistry of wine and uh, and 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 you're legally allowed to do it um, and there's a couple of different different acids that you can add, but it, it's just sort of it's it, it's added for one of those two reasons. And I think if you're adding it just to nudge the pH down a little bit, that's a very good way to use added acid, and often is undetectable to serious um, professional wine tasters. If you're adding acid because you think the wine doesn't naturally have enough acid in its balance, it doesn't taste acidic enough, then I think that can often be problematic because then the wine tastes out of balance because you've kind of made it what it's not. And that's why there are a lot of Pinot Gris out there in Australia that I really don't like because they don't have the natural balance that I want to see from Pinot Gris the way that it doesn't, they don't sit in the space that Pinot Gris wants to sit with the level of ripeness and the level of acid that it naturally, that naturally occurs in the grape juice. Um, that sounds very, um, that sounds very purest of me, but, uh, but I think that wine that, finds its natural balance fairly easily is often the wine that I most enjoy drinking. Right, there's lots of questions. Craig, dare I say, okay, do they judge this on points? So, Craig, I have put our Pinot Gris in shows before and it always does terribly because it's not, first of all, a lot of show judges have a um, have a, a, a natural distrust of Pinot Gris and think it's a terrible grape variety, which I think is awful. I don't think they should be allowed to judge the wine if they don't like Pinot Gris. But I think also this wine, um, as you've probably noticed, we've been talking for just over 30 minutes and the wine's changing in the glass all the time. I think it's looking better now than it was any other time during uh, tasting and it's going to keep getting better in the glass. And when you're tasting wine and judging it in a wine show, you it gets poured and you have maybe 30 or 40 or 50 wines in a bracket to taste, and you taste them, basically you go taste, spit, next. And you can't get the joy of this wine from tasting it that way. So this wine never does well in, in a show system type of tasting. It tends not to do very well um, from the critics either. We've sent Pinot Gris into um, Halliday and to Hugh and Hook uh, and various other people, and... Most of the Australian wine critics have a prejudice against Pinot Gris as a grape variety anyway, so they're, they're already, they've already decided it's going to be crap before they taste it. I know that sounds really unfair, but that, that's the sort of conversation that, is, that goes on behind the doors in, uh, amongst wine folk. And there's a lot of wine people that I know that I show this wine to and they go, oh, that's not bad for Pinot Gris, but I hate Pinot Gris, so why would I bother? Um, drinking it. And Dad and I were a little bit like, well, Dad was anyway. It was a little bit like that before we started making Pinot Gris. I've always had a real soft spot for this grape variety, partly because um, I started learning about wines that were not Maruduca State wine on Italian wines and had some incredible Pinot Gris in the early days and just went, this is awesome. And also Alsace. I love Alsace Pinot Gris. I think it's just amazing. Um, and I think that uh, this is my little mission in life at the moment. A few years ago, Chardonnay was very unpopular and I went around ranting about how wonderful Chardonnay is as a, as a grape variety. Um, 
is, uh, is and and Chardonnay has now become very popular. Pinot Gris is misunderstood. It's under um, underestimated by a lot of people, and I think putting it in the glass, having it with the right food, drinking it with friends, doing this more often is is really uh, an important thing for Pinot Gris uh, in general. And I think I'll be on the Pinot Gris mission for quite a long time um, because there's still a lot of people who who really don't don't love it, don't get it. So um, so yeah, I, this is you know a little bit of little bit of my personal passion project. Uh, and I and I do love I do love great Pinot Gris out there in the world. Now I'm missing everyone's comments. Thank you, Michael. I've gone well over the 30 minute mark, haven't I? So I'm sorry about that. And Viognier, yeah, I can, do you know Viognier was the one great variety that I always struggled to spell for the um, when I was studying for my Master of Wine uh, exam. So I had to like write it out a hundred times so that I could actually spell it correctly. Zach and Jack, the alcohol is highish because the fruit is riper. We pick it later um, in the ripening process than we do with the Chardonnay because we like our Chardonnay to be a bit crisper. We like our Chardonnay to have sort of um, citrus fruit and white uh, white stone fruit fruit characters, whereas we want our Pinot Gris to be a bit richer, a bit riper. We like the shape of the wine better with that little bit of extra ripeness. And that's another thing that's sort of controversial about this wine, I guess, out there in the in in the um, professional wine world. Uh, um, <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Trying to get something else. Not, yeah, it, look, uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure um, what you're – asking the K, but I think trying to change the essential character of a grape variety by manipulating it in the winery is not something that we're that interested in doing here at Murdoch. We're trying to trying to let these grape varieties that we work with that we think are good varieties for this region, we're trying to let them shine through as their best selves. <laughs> Using lots of lots of positive reinforcement. Um, but yes, trying to get, you know, Pinot, best Pinot Gris flavours out of our Pinot Gris, best Chardonnay balance and flavours out of our Chardonnay, best Pinot Noir characters and flavours out of our Pinot Noir. So um, <laughs> thank you, Shell, for the joy of wine. Everything's made up and points don't matter. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Thank you, Shell. I like that a lot. Pete, we're going to have to do some work on that tagline on the um, on the old, uh, on the old um, hoodie as well. Thank you, Craig. Um, <laughs> Michael. We, I love Riesling. I think Riesling's fantastic. I don't think it really is suited to the climate down here. Uh, the peanut, the Rieslings that I've tasted from down here generally just don't have the um, the lilt that I want to see in Riesling. And I think I think good Riesling is delicious, but I think we'll probably um, not go down the Riesling path here at Murudak. Um, but absolutely uh, we should actually we should actually have a, a, a couple of um, guest wines in the next few boxes of varieties that we don't do here that we don't get a, t a chance to taste and I'll pick out a Riesling that I think is um, one that's that's super fun and delicious maybe for one of our one of our next few boxes so we can taste together thank you Emily um, it'll, it's you know it'll be the, the Pinot Gris army uh, <laughs> Deb, I like it. Orange Mountain View on you. Um, Craig, I agree. I reckon that um, one of the great uh, grape varieties for orange is Viognier. I think it's delicious. Um, Sauvignon Gris. Alison, Sauvignon Gris uh, is not – so Sauvignon Gris would be a, a mutation of Sauvignon Blanc um, that would grow somewhere, I would say, in the Loire probably. Um uh, it would be it would be native to somewhere in France anyway, and uh, and and no one uh, no one that I know of has planted Sauvignon Gris in Australia. Um, uh, I don't think it's a blend between Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Gris. I think it's a different um, mutation of of Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, I've tasted one once, and I can't really remember what it was like. So sorry about that. Okay, okay, Shell. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get. I'm going to get the art. Have a chat to Peter. I'm just going to go over there and get the picture. I'll be back. Hang on. I knew I'd forgotten something when I came and sat down. So, everyone, this is... <laughs> am I picking at my ear, am I, Michael? Sorry. I'm just pulling it. Um... I have a picture of a hoodie for you guys to look at. 
Now, this is Peter's uh, design. I think it's awesome. Um, if you like it, then we're going to put out an order form next week when Jeff and I can get together and put something together for an email out. Uh, the, um, the printers say that it will take them three or four weeks to produce it because they're really busy at the moment. So, uh, so what we have to decide now, well, we don't have to decide now, but if you could give me some feedback in the next few days, if you like the colour, um, we have to, we have to work out what the tagline is, but anyway, I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm driving you mad, aren't I? Here we go. I hope you can see it properly on the thing. So. So Peter's concept is background burgundy and it's supposed to be, if you look at it, it does actually say drinks with Kate in red, white and amber coloured wine that's sloshing around in a glass. That's the idea. It's kind of splashing around in a receptacle, a big glass. Um, there is actually a hidden duck in there um for 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 all of us geeks who like a little a little hidden surprise and i don't know if you can i don't know if it'll be backwards or or forwards the um the writing um but there's a little he's put a little um a little tagline on the side here which i'll read to you it's quite psychedelic um it was inspired by another t-shirt that uh richard and jeremy um have i think it's really fun um I was I was actually voting for a cream coloured hoodie rather than the burgundy, but I, but the burgundy is starting to um, is starting to really uh, is really starting to kind of work its way into my heart. And what it says on it, as well as drinks with Kate, let me see. It says drinks with Kate on pour since two thousand and twenty. That's what he's written as a little tagline on pour since two thousand and twenty, which I quite like. I quite like quite a lot. But we have got some other competition for the tagline, and whether this hoodie should say Murudaka State on it somewhere as well is um, that's true. Alison um, Burgundy is much uh, much more practical um, for for all of us who like to spill things on ourselves, which is me absolutely. Especially when you're drinking red wine, right? You'll never see red wine stains on this thing. So this is the hoodie concept. If you love it. It should say Murudaka State too, Alice, and I agree. I, so, Pete, we need to get a Murudaka State on there somewhere in the picture. Um, we need to decide on the tagline. It is only the club will understand it. No, it doesn't need me. Maybe a duck on the hood, maybe a duck on the back, maybe maybe a little duck somewhere, somewhere there. Anyway, that's the concept. If you like it, we're going to be taking orders hopefully from next week. So, yeah. <laughs> It actually, it'll be quite big though, um, Rob and Deb. Uh, maybe some colour. Yes, yes, yes. Excellent. Craig, I was wondering about that on the back. I think Pete's trying to keep all the printing on the front to keep the price down for us, but I think it's going to be quite reasonably priced as well. So, um, so yeah, that's the that's the concept. Last look. And I think it, it is kind of hard to read. Oh, Kay doesn't love it. Okay. Powered by Maruduka State, that's quite good, Zach and Jack. Um, and I think that if we do this one, we might, Pete, have to look at something that's much more conservative and much more sort of just Murudak, Um, very obviously Maruduka drinks with Kate and keep it very kind of, keep it very, um, uh, have a calm one as well. But I do, I do, I do love it. I do love it, and I love Powered by Murudaka State. Maybe that'll kind of, you know, make it, make it, uh, make it complete. So thank you, everyone. <laughs> Hello, Kenneth. You pop up at the end sometimes, don't you? It's good to see you. <laughs> Cheers by Murudaka State. It's quite good too. That's quite good too. And um, I have another drum roll for you. Drum roll for the winner of the food and wine matching photography competition last week now it was very close it was very close and honorable mentions have to go to uh have to go to shell that was another magnificent uh picture of food and wine and me and it was difficult as well because of the whirly circle of death that we had to deal with um uh and uh and yes so uh so uh runner-up shell uh Thank you very much. That was awesome.
But our winner for last week is Craig. Actually, Joan probably because Joan probably did the food. But but Craig Goodman and and Karen and Joan, you guys are the winners. I think that that um, dear little that dear little pooch. Um, that little face kind of got me there. It was absolutely fabulous. And I've got to say as well, Anne, um, uh, we we seem to have a few beagles in the audience here because we had a couple of couple of beagles came out. But well done, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, I was very inspired by your wine and food matching last week. Uh, Craig, there will be a little prize coming your way very soon. Um, and uh, it will probably come with that bottle of wine that was missing out of your pack. So uh, if anyone does check their pack and we've packed it incorrectly, um, then uh, do let us know because every now and again we do make a, a little mistake. We're not quite perfect, but we're nearly there. Uh, <laughs> well, maybe we'll send, send the dog a prize instead <laughs> as well, perhaps. Um, well done, everyone. Thank you so much for joining in, and thank you for all of your all of your um, all of your fun. It was really good. It's it's true. It's true, Shell. The secret pet trick. And I don't think your cat was in that photograph. If he was, he was being very, very, very subtle um, this time around. <laughs> but no, you all did great, and I hope that the food was uh, was was a reward in and of itself. So there you go. What are Shell and Kenna? Kenna. It's just a little crush. <laughs> nice. Thanks, everyone. So I know that cat. Cats are like that. They can be very stubborn sometimes. It's been awesome, everyone. Thank you so much. I'm going to leave you to your evenings. Next week we're going to do the 2019 Magic Stalk Shiraz. Um, I've had and, – and, and just so that you know, the Magic Stock Shiraz is not going to go up on the shop, but we will send you some links to being able to buy it because, as you remember, before we only made about 20 cases of it, so really it's just going to go to you guys. Um, so 2019 Shiraz, awesome to see you guys. Enjoy the rest of your Pinot Gris. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Watch out for the email about the uh, hoodie and maybe T-shirt and maybe um, – some a little bit of redesigning but it sounds like most of you are pretty keen on the hoodie so I think we're on a bit of a winner there don't worry there'll be more merch going forward if this is successful just try and stop us <laughs> so have a have a lovely have a lovely evening everyone cheers everyone and uh enjoy your pinot gris drink more pinot gris Woohoo!